In this video, we're going to prove the n variable arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality. And the method we're going to use is called Cauchy induction. Now Cauchy induction differs a little bit to the regular induction or the standard induction that we come across in the HSC course. So before we get into the proof, it's probably a good idea to flesh out what the steps are for Cauchy induction, try to see why it actually works, why it proves the statement for all values of n that we're interested in, um, and then we'll get into the proof of it. So Cauchy induction starts off like regular induction in that we need to prove a base case. Now in our claim here, we're claiming that this is true for n greater than or equal to two. I suppose it's actually true for n greater than or equal to one, but n equals one case is a bit boring. So we're just doing it for n greater than or equal to two. And so we have to have our base case as with standard induction. Now the next step is where things differ. In regular induction, we assume that if p of k is true, then p of k plus one is true. So we're proving p of k plus one conditionally on the fact that p of k is true. In Cauchy induction, it's a little bit different. Here we're going to show that if p of k is true, then p of 2k is true. So there's the first difference between Cauchy induction and our regular induction. And then Cauchy induction has an extra step. We once again want to show that if p of k is true, something else is true. But this time, we're showing that if p of k is true, then p of k minus one is true. So there's actually an extra step here, and these two steps combined do a lot of work for us. Now, it might seem a little bit abstract just seeing it in this symbolic form. So perhaps if we write out a list of these propositions, which is essentially what p of something means, it means we're um, taking the statement, this statement here, and we're writing it for whatever value of n. Let's write out the list of propositions and see how this uh, or these three steps prove it for all values of n that we're interested in. So we'll start off with p of two because that's our base case and I'll list out a few of them. Okay, so let's suppose we've got this list of propositions that we're trying to prove. Now we always start off by proving our base case. So p of two, we tick that off because we've proved it. Now let's try to understand what this second statement is doing. It says that if I know some statement is true for a particular value of n, then I know it's going to be true for two times that value of n. So in our case, I know my statement is true for n equals two. I know that p of two is true, which means then for sure I can guarantee that p of two times two or p of four is true. So I've proven p of two is true, that now gives me that p of four is true. So I can tick off p of four. But now that I know p of four is true, it should also be true for p of two times four. So p of eight, which means I jump forward to p of eight. And I know that this is true, I can give that a tick. But then I know that if p of eight is true, then p of two times eight, which is p of 16 would be true. And so I would jump over to p of 16, wherever that is down in the list, and that would be true. And so we're going forward in this, in this list of propositions that we're trying to prove, but we're missing some gaps, right? We've missed P of three, we've missed five, six, seven, and so on. So in order to um, collect all of these missing pieces, we have this other condition or other, um, other part of our induction, our Cauchy induction, which fixes that. Let's run through it. What it's saying is that if P of K is true, then P of K minus one is true, which means the term before it or the, the proposition before it should be true. So we start at P of two and we jump to P of four, but now I'm able to jump back one because if P of four is true, then P of four minus one should be true, which means P of three is true. So let's say that that means I'm now able to jump back and I can tick this off. Okay, I was able to end up with P of eight is true by jumping forward like this. Now I can jump backwards and I get P of seven is true. But if P of seven is true, then P of six is true. But if P of six is true, then P of five is true and so on. So what we're able to do here is we're able to jump forward in our list. In our list here, there's an infinitely long list of propositions we're trying to prove. We're able to jump forward and then we're also able to jump backwards and collect all the ones that we've missed in our, in our jump forward. 
And so that's why sometimes couch induction is also known as forwards backwards induction, because we're literally jumping forward and then jumping backwards in order to collect all of our statements for all values of n. Okay, so that's the idea behind Cauchy induction. It's quite a neat way of, of collecting all the values of n that we're interested in. And it actually simplifies, in some scenarios, it simplifies the proof. And it certainly simplifies the proof of the AM-GM inequality. With regular induction, it's still doable. It just becomes a little bit more involved. So now let's jump into the actual proof of this using Cauchy induction. All right, here we go. We start off by proving our base case. So when n is equal to two, what we're trying to do is we're really trying to show that x1 plus x2 on two is greater than or equal to the square root of x1, x2. Okay, this is something we've saw in the previous video, so we can really quickly go ahead and do this. Okay, so we can now say p of two is true, and there's our base case done. Okay, the next part is that we need to assume p of k is true and prove p of 2k is true. So we make our assumption. We assume that p of, whoops, p of k is true for some value of k greater than or equal to 2. Okay, so in other words, what does this mean? This means that we're assuming that x1 plus x2 all the way up to xk divided by k is greater than or equal to the kth root of the product of those terms, x2 all the way to xk. Okay, this is our assumption. I know I have to use it, so I'm going to label it in order to refer to it when I need to use it in my inductive process. Okay. Now what we want to do is we want to prove that it's true for p of 2k. So I'm going to actually write down what that means because it's always very useful to see in front of you what it is that you're trying to prove. Okay, so this is what we're trying to prove here. And somehow we need to make use of our inductive hypothesis, the starred, um, the starred inequality. Now, what is the starred inequality? It starts off with an arithmetic mean of k numbers x1 up to xk so what i want to do if i want to be able, if i want to use this this uh, inequality here i really need to have k variables separated out and we can do that here because we have 2k variables so i can split them into two groups of k variables and then i'd be able to apply this uh, starred equation or this starred inequality i should say to each of those groups. So the first thing I'll do is I'll say the left-hand side is equal to, and I'll just factor out a half, and now I'll split it into the first k numbers plus the second k numbers. So I've got x plus, or x1 plus x2 all the way up to xk, that's divided by k, plus xk plus one, all the way up to x 2k, and that's divided by k. So what I have here is I've got k, I've got the arithmetic mean of k numbers, which I can, I can say is greater than or equal to their geometric mean. And here I've got the arithmetic mean of k different numbers, which I can say is greater than or equal to their geometric mean. So this is now less than or equal to a half, the kth root, of x1 all the way up to xk plus the kth root of xk plus 1 times all the way up to x2k. All right, now what do we have here? We've got some number. I know it's an ugly number. It's the kth root of something, but it's just a number. It's a positive real number plus another positive real number. And it's being divided by 2. So you can kind of think of this here, you can think of this as A, and you can think of this as B. And so what we've got is we've got A plus B on two, and I know from my, actually it's from, I've even proven it up here, in my base case, I know that this is greater than or equal to the geometric mean of AB. 
So I know that that's greater than or equal to root AB. Okay, so this means that this is greater than or equal to the square root of the kth root of x1 xk times the kth root of xk plus 1 to x2k and that's the square root of all of this okay now underneath that big square root we've got two kth roots we can merge those together that becomes the kth root of x1 times all the way up to xk times xk plus 1 all the way to x2k so it's the, the kth root of that and then I square root that thing and then what does this equal this equals the 2kth root because if you think about it suppose we have some number let's write it on the side here we have some number y that we take the kth root of and then we square root it if we write it in fractional powers it becomes a bit easier to see what's going on it's y to the power of 1 on k or to the power of a half I've got a power to a power and we multiply those two powers so this becomes y to the 1 on 2k which is the 2kth root of y okay and so this expression here is the 2kth root of x1 all the way down to x2k okay and this is our right hand side so our left hand side is greater than or equal to our right hand side and so therefore what we've shown is that if pk is true then p of 2k is true and that checks off that's the second part of our Cauchy induction now for the third part so the third part is we want to still using the same assumption that pk is true we want to prove that p of k minus 1 is true so let's write down what we're trying to prove okay so this is what we're trying to prove now what we're going to do is we're actually going to start off with our assumption with our inductive hypothesis so we're going to say from star we have that x1 plus x2 all the way up to I'm going to write the second last term and the last term all of this divided by k is greater than or equal to the kth root of x1 times all the way down to xk minus 1 times xk okay so this is our assumption so this is now like a fact that we're able to use now the motivation for the next step is not terribly obvious but there is some some signs that we can that we can take in order to help us think about what to do here what i know i want to do is i want to end up with k minus 1 terms here but i've actually got k terms so somehow it's like i want to lose this last term i don't want an xk i don't want this kth variable i want to turn that into something else now one thing about this assumption is that we're assuming that this is true for all values or all positive real values I should say of x1 x2 and so on up to xk so this should be true no matter what the value of xk is right I could just change this to a 1 if I wanted to and change that to a 1 and my statement should be true because it holds for all values of xk so what we're going to say is since this holds so since this holds for all values of xk it certainly holds for the particular value of xk which is xk equal to x1 plus x2 plus all the way up to xk minus 1 divided by k minus 1. so it's going to be a little bit of a nightmare to actually write this out but it, it will get us there in the end so let's go ahead and and write this okay so this is what we have now we've substituted in this particular value of xk into this statement here because it holds for all values of xk and i've written that particular value of xk in blue just so we can track what's going on a little bit now what i'm going to do on the left hand side is i'm going to try to tidy this up a little bit and turn it into one fraction so 
In order to do that, I'm going to make one fraction in the numerator first, which means I'm going to multiply this expression here all by k plus one. So what I might do in order to save myself a little bit of writing is do this with green, multiply this here by k minus one, and then I'm also going to divide by k minus one. So now in my numerator, I have two fractions with the same denominator of k minus one. I can add the numerators of the numerator. And what I end up having is I've got k minus one lots of this sum plus one lot of that sum, which gives me a total of k lots of that sum. So on my left hand side here, I actually end up with k times x1 plus x2 plus all the way down to x k minus one. This is divided by k minus one, and then that is divided by k. And this should be greater than or equal to this term here, which I have no plans of changing just yet, and so I can duplicate it and bring it down. Okay, so now I can see that I've got this k, which can be eliminated with uh, this k here. Okay, so I can cancel that k with that k, and I'm left with x1 plus x2 all the way down to xk minus 1 divided by k minus 1 is greater than or equal to this same expression. Duplicate and I'll bring it down. All right, now the only thing that's annoying me is that this is still a power of 1 on k, it's still a kth root. I'd like it to be a k minus 1 root and I'd like to get rid of this blue term. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise both sides to the power of k. So this thing here, again I can duplicate, raise it to the power of k. That's greater than or equal to everything that's underneath my k root there. And now you can see that what I have here in blue is exactly the same as what's inside this bracket here. And so if I divide by this blue term on both sides, and I can do that because it's a positive term, I, won't, I don't have to worry about changing this inequality sign, I'll end up with k minus one factors of it on the left hand side. So this tells me then that I've got x1 plus x2 all the way down to xk minus one divided by, let's make that a bit neater, divided by k minus one all to the power of k minus one, greater than or equal to x1, x2, xk minus one. Now I can take the k minus one root, and I'll get to what I want in the end, which is that x1, whoops, plus x2, plus all the way up to xk minus one divided by k minus one, is greater than or equal to the k minus one root of x1, x2, xk minus 1. And so there we've proven p of k minus 1, given that p of k is true. So therefore p of k has, well, let's say p of k true, has implied p of k minus 1 is true. And so we've actually completed all of the steps of our Cauchy induction, and so we can say, therefore, by Cauchy induction, P of N is true for N greater than or equal to 2. And that is the end of our proof.